everybody. How's it going? Welcome back to another episode of the Light After Trauma podcast. I'm your host, Alyssa Scaleri. I hope that everybody is doing well and is hanging in there as this pandemic is hopefully coming to a close. I am excited today to announce our guest, who is Dr. Allison J. K. For more than 25 years, Dr. Allison has practiced as a mind body energy healer, founding the vibrational upgrade system and working in yoga, meditation, and Qigong, energy medicine, mind body fitness, longevity, and holistic health with a specialization in the chakra system. Considered one of the leading experts in her field, she has taught around the world and has written three books. The award-winning, What If There's Nothing Wrong, Vibrational Upgrade, A Conspiracy for Your Bliss, Easing Humanity's Evolutionary Transition, Reasonable Dragons, How to Activate the Field of Possibilities, Where Logical Magic is the New Normal, and her latest masterpiece, The Dragon Master Creatrix, Conversations with the Female Spiritual Teacher for These New Times. And with that being said, I am going to turn it over to the highly successful and wonderful Dr. Allison. Hi, Dr. Allison. How are you? I'm good, Alyssa. How are you? (laughs) Good. I'm so happy that you are here today. Dr. Allison and I were just chatting off recording and we were were talking for about a half hour because (laughs) we just had like an instant connection and I, I really love the work that she's doing and I think that all of you will be will be blown away by what she has to say today. So my first question I have to ask. So you studied in Asia for 10 years. So tell me like what happened that got you over to Asia? I was already doing energy medicine and holistic health wellness sessions alongside classroom teaching and administrating. And I remember one Saturday morning, a client, she's probably in a series of like 10 sessions. She was probably like in her fourth. She was getting great results. I was really pleased. My hands are over her belly, upper belly and lower belly. I'll talk about what those actually are later in the chakra system. And was really pleased with the update she'd given me and what I'd been seeing. And I like looked up and asked my guidance and AKA the sky, the universe, the divine, uh, how does it get any better than this? How do I get even more robust results for my clients? And right around that same time, I was balancing my checkbook pre-digital banking and I had a master's and I had taken out barely any loans. I had worked all the way through. And so I didn't have a big loan to pay back. All I was wanting was organic food, massage a week, because I consider that preventive health 101. I had basic housing, basic car. I mean, Ford Escort at that time. I wasn't living high on the hog. And I had already traveled and lived around the world prior, like even as a senior in, co- in high school, rather. I was an exchange student in Venezuela. So I'm, I'm used to adventure and fun, and I demand that I have that in abundance, ease, and joy, and I just know that we're not meant to struggle. So when I was looking at my checkbook that Saturday morning, right around the same time I had had that session and asked that question about how do I get even more robust results for my clients, I realized this wasn't enough. I'm not going to be in this cage for decades as a teacher, barely scraping by. Just know it's not acceptable. Where's the joy? Where's the adventure? Where's the abundance? Where's the fun? Uh-uh. So within a month's time at most, my intuition showed me and turned me on to the international school system. A colleague actually brought it up to me. So that's what I consider a synchronicity when I'm asking for the information to be brought in so I can up level. So I went, did what I had to do, submitted applications, traveled to the place where all the international school heads were coming in and all of us wanting to place we interviewed in all these different hotel rooms throughout the day. So it was all over the world, literally throughout the weekend. It got a bunch of job offers and chose Taiwan because it's the Chinese culture. And I considered both the Chinese and the Indians of, of the yoga culture, the Hindu Indians, to not only understand how energy works, subtle energy works and consciousness works, but to still be operating from it today. Whereas like in the West, we had alchemists, but they went underground into the mystery schools. So that's how. So that's so cool. So you have been, I mean, really, you were immersed in Eastern medicine. 
you got to write a list because I wasn't even an expat teacher living in the expat teacher's housing they provided. I said, please help me integrate. I want to immerse myself in the local culture. And so I was the one who lived downtown and I yes. used stipend instead of living in the teacher provided housing right next to the school where I'm still with a bunch of expats. I was like, no, I want to understand the locals. I want to understand. And so I, I didn't even realize it was any different than anybody else. My first weekend there, I traveled down to a certain forest because I wanted to discover this certain kind of tree and get something. And it had the same name. It's Ali Shan and Shan means mountain in Chinese, but it's close to my name and yours, Ali Shan, you know? So I was like, I want to go to that forest. And that was my first weekend there. And I couldn't speak a lick of Chinese. Well, I could speak a little bit of Chinese. I had studied before I went on purpose, but I couldn't read. And I was matching like maps to train, you know, signs. And so I did things that threw me out there that other expats didn't do. And so when I say I studied in Asia, I mean like I would get a traditional treatment every week, whether it's a twina massage or it's reflexology. And I'd sit there with the chart asking the person, like, what does this mean? What does this mean? In Chinese, I was then going to monasteries and talking to like, I would go for a run behind the monastery. There's a great forest path locally in one of them. But I drive down and go with a friend even later, um, who uh, to monasteries and, and, and sit there and immerse myself in the environment and ask questions and interact with monks. And so then when I would go on breaks, I wouldn't come back to the States mid year between semesters during Chinese New Year, I would only come back to the States in the summer. So I'd go around Southeast Asia. And a lot of the time it was Thailand because it's just, it's great. And so um, magical. I've heard it's so magical. Oh, Jesus. It's fantastic. Like I've had other expat colleagues of mine go to like the Vietnam beaches as they were opening or go to India and I actually had tickets to go with that friend to India. And I backed out at the last minute. I had tickets three times to go to India before I finally made it. Cause I just knew it was a huge thing as a traveler. You, you have to be grounded and you have to be ready to tackle India. So I just went to Thailand cause I knew how easy they make it for tourists. It's their number one industry. And so both of those friends left their trips like within the first five days and came to meet me in Thailand at different times because they know how easy <laughs> it is in Thailand to travel. So, but yeah. while there, I'd get treatments and I'd ask questions and I'd learn and I took classes. That's actually where I learned Qigong and then furthered it back in Taiwan. But I was piecing together my understandings from what I had already known because I was already teaching meditation and I was already practicing energy medicine and holistic health and wellness in the States, getting trained in herbalism. I had started with the Native Americans and then it, it went from there. So then it went, I went over there and now here I am back. And now you've brought what you learned about Eastern medicine and you've brought it back to the States. And I, we were talking about this, but I'm I'm so passionate about this topic and Eastern medicine. And I think it's because I have had my run of the mill Western medicine and nothing has helped. If anything, it has made me worse. And I think that while Western medicine can be beneficial at times, it definitely has its limits. Now, would you agree with that? Yeah. Let me give you two things. One is when I was, so here's, here's the story. Let me start with this one. Two women were in this local gym that I was a member of, and one woman was in her 60s and one woman was in her 90s. The woman in her 90s was spry, coming out of the pool, didn't need anything to assist her with walking, really looked great. So they go into the steam room together. The 60-year-old asks her, what is going on with you? How are you able to be this vibrant and alive at your age? She said, I never went on any Western med. So, wow. There are certain Western medications that help people. There really are, like with certain heart issues or but like there's the consideration of, so here's an idea. One of the things when I had my own radio show, I had a nutritionist on, he was the first nutritionist on the first food pyramid meeting the government ever had before setting up the FDA suggested food pyramid. And he left because he was surrounded by beef and dairy industry people. Mm. But one of the things that he said was they, he wrote later the China study and he went over to a certain part of mainland China. I was in Taiwan, the small democratic island that has more traditional practices able to be practiced openly so I could learn more about their spirituality or Taoism. But up on mainland China, there was a a province where the people hadn't been exposed much yet to the West. And so they ate a lot of tofu. And so what the study did is they went in and introduced the Western diet. And as soon as a certain period of time, I don't remember exactly how much, on the Western diet, they started having diabetes kick in. They started having high blood pressure kick in and they started being overweight and bigger. So they were, they're considered markers of like typically Western or even American 
diseases from the practices. So I know that I say you can eat your way out of it. Uh, I feel like I used to do more talks in local health food stores where I would present longevity tonic herbs in like latte form or, or a mocha or a chai latte. I would mix together these different medicinal mushrooms and flavors that would end up tasting like mocha or chai lattes, but they were stocked full of tonic herbs that are known in the East to increase longevity, vitality, well-being. There's even the reishi mushroom, which is considered the queen of medicinal mushrooms that actually helps elevate your spirits. So I'm saying all of this because of just wanting to expose other possibilities. When you talk about Western medicine, not being able to get to it all, we're responsible. And, and, and we're in a time now, especially where we need to look at our own choices instead of projecting the responsibility of our health and well being onto doctors and authority figures and, and learn about nutrition and learn about what foods and observe how our body reacts when we eat certain foods. So the power is in our hands. And in the time when we used to defer that power, even to a priest for our spirituality. Mm -hmm. or to a psychiatrist for our mental well-being, or to a doctor our physical health. That's no longer the case. So when I was, this is the second thing I wanted to tell you, Alyssa and listeners, when I was in my bachelor's program, my mom at age 12 had said to me, you are so good with people, Allison, you have a natural understanding, you might want to consider going into psychology. And God bless us, she was so intuitive and we were so tight. I knew it was a yes. And so I did it. And I, by my third semester, I was like, you had to be kidding me. I'm learning nothing about what it takes to be the happiest, most thriving version of me. Yeah. But I left that major. It was all about the hard wiring, which I understand in the beginning stage, you got to learn about the hard wiring of the brain, but they were in the stages of proving themselves as a science. And it's only in the nineties, the early nineties that I just got the certification, a specialty certification in behavioral change because I'm a personal trainer. So it was, I opted for that as part of my personal trainer CEUs and there was a field of psychology created in the nineties called positive psychology. So that was after yes. I was already going for my bachelor's. Right. So I have been ever since then exploring, okay, so how do we become the most happy thriving versions of ourselves? And I've been led to the holistic model and to what some of the things you've already heard me say, Western medicine can't get it all. It's not designed to. It can't. And I really love the point about what you said about how it's, it truly is our job to know what we need and to not rely on somebody else to tell us what we need. I mean, in some ways we can rely on doctors for certain things, but at the end of the day, we have to turn inward to understand what it is that we need to be able to live the lives that we want to live. So one of the things that I really want to ask you about today, because I do not have a lot of understanding on this at all. I am very new to this idea of Eastern medicine. You little newborn baby, you. <laughs> I know. I'm a noob. I am such a newbie, but I am loving it. So help me and the listeners out there understand the chakras because you do a lot of chakra work. Mm -hmm. So what the hell is a chakra? Okay. It's my first question. All right. So let me start here. Have you ever heard of something, an interpretation, like if a body part hurts, then that means such and such a thing. As in like, if your feet or legs or hips hurt, that means metaphorically your body's saying you mentally and spiritually don't want to move forward. Yes. Okay. So that used to be like the kind of interpretation that would happen that I would see in the holistic community and going beyond the physical causes for dis-ease. And I didn't find it reliable. When I was doing the energy medicine sessions in the States, I didn't find that reliable. Now, I learned about the chakra system before I left for Asia. And I'm a certified yoga teacher in India. And when I was in India and I had to produce a sequence so the reason why you feel so good after you do yoga is because every single yoga pose is designed to open a chakra. You hardly ever hear that in the studios in the West, but that's I really don't going yeah. off. I know I'm an avid yogi and I have never heard that in any class that I've been in. So let me give you this eight limbs of yoga. I'm an Ashtanga trained teacher, which is the most substantial and traditional as well as athletic form of yoga. And that having been said, there's considered eight limbs to yoga, and only one of them is about the body postures or the asanas. 
five of the eight limbs is about working with the mind and your consciousness. Whoa. Yeah. And look at what we extrapolated and, and populated the West with, right? Yeah. So a chakra means wheel from Sanskrit, translating the word into English. It means wheel, like one that turns a wheel on a car, for example, or cart. So we have seven of them. They're in the ones at the top of our head. This is the main chakras from a beginning perspective. One's at the top of the head called the crown. One's in between the eyebrows. That's the sixth. The fifth is at the throat. The fourth is at the heart. The third is at the upper belly. The second is at the lower belly, about an inch beneath the navel. And the first is the root at the tailbone. And every chakra is the intersection of the mind, the body, and the spirit. And so by mind, now keep in mind, I ended up in the international school I was in for the longest in Taiwan, I ended up teaching AP psychology based on my bachelor's training because I had also created a global psychology course using the Dalai Lama's texts with his biannual summits with Western docs and psychologists, as well as the College 101, Psych 101 textbook. And I created a course called Global Psychology. And then they were like, ooh, because I was teaching meditation to the students too. Why don't you teach AP Psych? So I did. And so I've been able to revisit psychology after decades of gaining this understanding from meditation and yoga and, and consciousness and how it works. So it's even more fascinating to me. And I bring it together in a bit of a different way. So if a chakra means wheel and it is the intersection of the mind, the body, and the spirit, by mind, the mind component, I mean the conscious mind that you, whose thoughts you do hear, and the unconscious and the subconscious. And we also call in the West recently, we're calling it super consciousness. In yoga, we call that higher self, where it's our higher consciousness that then eventually up above that connects with the divine. So all of those levels of consciousness, I'm able to reach all those levels of the mind and keep in mind that we make our daily choices from only using at most 15% from our conscious mind. So at least 85%, and I think it's closer to 90 from everything I've seen from the tens of thousands of people I've worked with, people are making their daily choices from the unconscious. Unprefix means not, subconscious, sub means under. So it's not the thoughts you hear, whether you have a meditation practice or not, that is the majority, at least 85% of where you're making your what to drink, what to listen to, what to click on, what to go to, what to avoid, what to eat from. Meaning when we drive, when you learn to drive a car, Alyssa, you were told and you said out loud, probably shift, hit brake, put foot on gas, directions right. out loud, right? You don't do it anymore, right? Nope. That's what I'm talking about. So there's all this stuff buried in what I've come to call the back of the house consciousness that is responsible for where we're making our choices from. And in that is our past, is our imprints, is our conditioning, is our karma, is our buried beliefs and conclusions about like from ages zero to two, we have no separation from our parents we think and feel what they do, starting at two with the terrible twos and the no's. No! Then we're <laughs> forming our identity. We're separating. And so from two to eight-ish, we're looking around, seeing how life gets done on planet Earth and having childlike conclusions wired into our brain at the subconscious level. And so we may have, like, how do I get that yummy feeling from mom? And we may have an older brother or sister and look at them, how they get that yummy feeling from mom, that smile or that hug or that love or that attention or that approval. So it could be, oh, my older brother just came home from school and he got an A plus on that project. And mom hugged him and, and dad gave him a $5 bill or a $20 bill. That must be how I get good stuff, that good feeling. So then the person could become a really good student wired in the back of the brain. But if other things along the way also happen, like other conditioning, maybe trauma here and there, that person might become a perfectionist. So it might go out of balance is what I'm saying. So then it becomes a block and then it goes to the relevant chakra. So part of perfectionism is the third chakra because every chakra covers a domain of life. So I'm going to stop there for a second. If every chakra covers a domain of life, meaning it has the right to do something. So your root chakra is your right to be here. 
The second chakra is your right to feel what you feel. Your third chakra is your right to desire what you desire. So just keeping those and stopping there. If I don't feel like I have the right to be here because in the womb, mom may have been hesitant about having me worrying how she was going to take care of me. And I picked up on that through the water, the energy, because I was just sitting there absorbing it and water is extra sonar for energy. Absolutely. Very important to point out. I know I've said this before in previous podcast episodes, but even when you are in utero, you are still affected by everything that is in your environment and all of the energy that your mother is passing on to you. So just wanted to put that in there, but go on. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And so that can end up in your wiring is happening. The first thing that gets is your brain and spinal column. Right. And so Mm -hmm. the root chakra is at the base of the spinal column for a reason. So in that period of time, if you, or there's some sense of neglect from a parent, you come out of the womb, let's come out of the utero because I don't want to overemphasize and take people along a path where they think it's only the root chakra is only about being in your mother's womb. It's not. So let's say in your first couple of years, one of the parents leaves. So you have a thing with abandonment or one of the parents um, rejects you. So you have a thing with rejection, all of that signaling to you. I don't have the right to be here. If I weren't here, maybe he wouldn't have left. If I weren't here, maybe she, she would have more time and wouldn't be so worried. So there's all those kinds of childlike conclusions. And because if they correspond to the right to be here, that's the root chakra, this territory. So if you don't feel like you have the right to be here, you usually don't feel like you have the right to feel what you feel because you're questioning your overall right to exist. Right. And then if you don't feel like you have the right to feel what you feel, you certainly don't feel like you have the right to desire what you desire and go out in the world and create it. So I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me because people seem to sometimes believe that the root, you have to start working at the root and work up sequentially. You don't, I can go all over the map. Okay. If I get your throat chakra cleared. So the throat chakra is um, your right to be heard, to speak and be heard. So if you lie a lot or you're lied to, if you don't feel like you're heard, if you have a thing with secrecy, All of that's what I consider the first level of the throat chakra. But since about 2016, because of the new times we're in, and I say new times from 2012 to 2032, it's a 20-year window of what's considered our greatest evolutionary leap for humanity ever. So we just spent the past nine, 10 years watching the old paradigm crumble. And we're in a stage right now where the new one hasn't been created yet. But we're meant to each becoming new. We're working towards it. Yep. And so I have come to understand like around 2016, I saw a lot of my clients, the majority of them having from their heart chakra up to their throat, like this fountain opening. And I had never seen it before. Talk about this in my my second book, Vibration Upgraded Conspiracy for Your Bliss, Easing Humanity's Evolutionary Transition, the co-creator's channel. And so what that means is being able to create based on what your heart's desiring. And the fifth chakra, the whole higher level of it is if you don't feel like you have the right to choose. If you don't feel like you have any choice, if you feel like you have to work this job because you have to get that health insurance, if you live in the States for your kids, or you have to stay in this job, you're stuck in this job because you have to make sure the mortgage gets paid, then you're going to have a tight neck, for example, or you may have, yes. thyroid, or you may have thyroid issues because let me come out of the mind now. So the body, mind, body, and spirit chakra is an intersection of all three at the body level. A chakra affects the region that it sits in. So it affects the musculature. So if it's not doing what it's meant to, meaning being a wheel and turning chi or prana or fresh vital life force energy in that region, then the musculature gets tight because it doesn't have fresh life force going through it. Additionally, every chakra is connected to a major endocrine gland. So for example, the throat is the thyroid. And it's the element here for the, I'm getting too advanced. Let me just leave it at that. And then Candace Pert, who was studying, um, I think it was antidepressants for uh, one of the big pharma companies. She knew of the chakra system. And when she was looking at the spinal column and the uh, brains for the central nervous system, she noticed that along the spine, the biggest neuroreceptor sites, the nerve ganglia, the biggest ones Mm -hmm. that have the most receptors to receive messages from the brain 
we're at each chakra along the spine. So that's our two communication systems, hormonal, endocrine system, or chemical, and electrical, or central nervous system. So the chakras are completely, and remember, I'm a yoga teacher and a personal trainer, and I have some certifications in herbalism, different herbalism. I'm very much focused on the body. I'm not about like floating out of the body and meditation and connecting with angels. I'm very much about thriving in the body here on planet earth and having your yep. material life, whether it's your relationships, your health or your money or how you earn your money completely infused with the most thriving possible. So the third element is the spiritual mind, body, spirit intersection at each chakra. And in that spirit aspect, I can connect in with past life stuff and I can connect in with karmic stuff. And I had to go through years of training and spend tens of thousands of dollars to understand how to clear karma because it's tricky stuff. So anytime you think that there's a physical issue that can be solved only at the physical level, traditional Chinese medicine has an axiom that says where she goes, that's energy, vital life force energy, blood follows. So where energy goes, the physical follows. I add on to that nowadays where consciousness goes or where our focus of our consciousness goes, that's where energy follows and then the physical. And this is what quantum physics is understanding about the wave and particle phenomena. It's the same thing. So what we perceive as most important because we can physically see it, because it's tangible, we consider in the West typically the physical is more important. Like I can assess you based on what I see physically. I can prove myself with my intellect, go to that good school, get that good degree, place in that good job, get that kind of size house, get that kind of vehicle. Now I've made it because my measurements are up there for what people, the, and when we're in an uh, IMAX movie theater, for example, there is the big sound, surround sound, right? The bigger, the better seems to be a lot of the thinking here. And so that's old school. When you understand about energy, energy is actually what is creating the matter. It has to exist in energy first before matter. So if somebody has, if I can get to somebody's emotional or mental or even spiritual blockages first, then they will never have a physical thing pop to the surface. Okay. Once something has come out of a more subtle level and gone into physical, so the Tibetans have a scale, subtle energy to crude. So crude is the most grossly physical. It's, this is the most subtle. And there's a range as you go out of subtle, 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 more energy. Like now I can, like I consider the yogic culture more able to perceive the subtler energies than even the Chinese. So Chinese's chi is more crude. They look at the kidney, the liver, and that energy travels along the meridians. But before that, the yogic culture understands how interaction with the ether affects our system. That's too much distinction for this level. But the point is, in that scale between subtle energy to crude, before it gets to that level of physical, if we catch it, then it doesn't have to result in a physical issue. I found that when I was doing more health concerns, like a tumor or cancer or chronic pain, I had to go so much higher and I had to apply so much more energy to the person's body because it had already physically manifested. Right. Because you didn't catch it in time. Yes. Okay. I'm getting it. I'm understanding yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. So now for somebody, let's say who, how do you work on healing? Like what does chakra work look like? So with me, it looks totally different than what anybody else looks. So if we call it chakra work, I, I want to call that term back because I don't want people to think, honestly, I'm the only one doing the work the way I am. Like there's all those YouTubes that you go on and you think, I don't want you to think that if you go and listen to a YouTube clearing with a crystal bowl for the third chakra, that you're set for life and you shouldn't have any issues. Uh, it's just yeah. not that simple. I mean, it's a process. It's the spiritual path. It's the path of enlightenment. So there's like a ball of yarn where I have to come in and unwind or clear these beliefs that are blocking you that have led to a core pattern that we want to move you beyond. And typically trauma is trauma and karma are the most repetitive, redundant, resilient. They require the most for me to go at. So there's one more thing in the chakra system. If you think of them like an urban center, 
there's all of these highways and side routes and interstates that lead into each urban center and you're driving to that urban center. So those you could think of the 13 meridians in the traditional Chinese medical system, that's what the chi or life force travels on out through your body to distribute this fresh vital life force energy throughout your body. So it's loose and flexible and juicy and energized. In yoga, we call them nadis and there's like a thousand of them. So that's how the energy goes from one chakra to another. And it's meant to be flowing throughout our whole system. Okay. For those good feelings. Okay. So that's why we would open them to get that vital life force energy flushing throughout our system at the bodily level, at the energy level, and obviously up to the mind and at the spirit level, because it's the intersection of mind, body, and spirit. So I will go in in either if it's a, I don't tend to do one-on-ones that much anymore. I'm training more students to do it nowadays. I still do them for my students, basically, <laughs> which is great. It's great to be at that level of choice because I do more group work nowadays, mm-hmm. be able to help more people and serve more people. It's verbal clearings that you can hear me do. And so if somebody is in a group and I know that I will see cloudiness around their hips I will perceive like dankness or darkness or, or cloudiness or heaviness at their, under their sacral. And so I'll have a sense that that's sexual abuse. I might ask them first, are they constipated? I then might ask if it's a woman, are you having your period right now? And then typically I'll get guidance about what has happened to them. Mm-hmm. And so that I'll do a clearing to get that moving and it moves. And so like, then maybe an hour later on that same call, I will do something that would be the next level of unraveling to get to the core problem because there's always that core problem. So I teach my, I mean, I do this, I've been doing it with my hands for years and with local people on my massage table or at a distance, it doesn't matter because part of what I can do is teach you how to, using ancient symbols, how to open up an etheric tube so time and space doesn't matter. I mean, I feel like I may have to say because you guys are newbies, but it works. It's brilliant watching it work. It's fascinating. Yeah. It is. And so because I'm a finely tuned instrument at this point directed towards clearing people, like you're even getting it, as you heard me say before we hit record, you're even getting splashes of clearing as I talk about these items for you. So you guys may feel a little bit more energized or tired after the call, or more tired rather. So I affect by doing verbal clearings and then also hands-on or distance, and then even just by my field itself. So there's two elements, though. Once somebody has a, if you've had sexual trauma, one of the things that results typically is a lack of worthiness, lack of boundaries as well, because you're used to being invaded in a very inappropriate way. Absolutely. Right. So you may then, and this may sound illogical, but you may then without boundaries have very codependent relationships and be the overgiver. Mm -hmm. So in that overgiving pattern, what I would do is I would focus on your heart chakra and I would clear out all of the imprints, the conditioning, the uh, imprints from your parents and lineage, because mom may have modeled that overgiving, grandma may have modeled that overgiving, the conditioning of what you're supposed to, supposed to do as a mom in society, from whatever culture you're from, karma, contracts, oaths, vows, stuff you've said, it's stuff that's happened in other lifetimes, trauma, and all these unconscious or subconscious conclusions and beliefs and expectations and projections you've ended up with in order to keep yourself safe, particularly after a trauma. So it's almost like if I overgive, then I'm keeping myself safe from invasion down there because I have to overgive in order to have the right, because that's just how life works, right? So I get invaded. If you look at that, this is a Qigong move. If you get invaded down here, so energy moves, this is called the pushing and pulling of the waves. I'm doing stuff with my feet that I don't need to tell you right now. So obviously this looks like stepping out or giving, and you could think of this as receiving. So if you are full up in your field with the giving, you're occupying space. So it's almost an unconscious way to keep yourself from getting penetrated or invaded. 
Okay. Yeah. So I work at the level of all that unconscious and subconscious so that it frees up. And I do that through the relevant chakras so that it frees up more of that to now become conscious. And then I do more clearings and activations and coaching. Once you have the consciousness, like you say, oh, okay. And you may be in a moment, the mind body connection has been cut. So it's not any longer unconscious. You're not unconsciously doing it. So now you have at your conscious mind, I tend to overgive as a default mechanism. So the next time you see yourself engaging in stepping out and overgiving or having the thought about to do that, I do clearings and activations there to help you reroute to a new neurological path so that then a new behavior can get routed. This active applied coaching for mindfulness, I call it applied mindfulness, that has to accompany the clearings and activations so that you know how to then take over in your day-to-day life and actualize the change. It's so fascinating. And it's just, you know, for the listeners out there who couldn't see what Dr. Allison was just doing, she was sort of doing this motion where she was like bringing her hands back and then pushing them open palm towards me. And as she was doing that, I had a lot of feelings in my, forgive me, because I don't remember what chakra this is or what area, but it's right below my belly button. Yeah, that's the psych- the sacral, which is where you would feel it. Yes, because I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. So I was having, that's exactly where I had all of those feelings. So that is. <laughs> that, that's my light coming out of my hands from decades of using these hands in that way, going right at your sacral. It's mind blowing and it's very emotional. I could, I could honestly, I could sob. Like I said, before we started recording, I probably will sob because it's, I warned it's, you. Yeah. <laughs> I did. She, she did warn me. She did. Warn me. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to say this, please. The beauty of this is that that light knew where to go. I didn't say go to where she um, has had trauma. And I didn't know it was sexual trauma. I could, I did intuitively, but in that moment when I was doing that, I didn't direct it there, Alyssa. The beauty of this is that the light has a divine intelligence of its own. If you read my second book in particular, I talk about how it's like this unconditional love that surrounds us and permeates underneath the undercurrent of all of life. If we can even heal, that shows that there's a supportive force in all of life. But that knew where to go, that light knew where to go, and your system knew what to do with it. So there is a a quest for unconditional love that is wired into us and an understanding of that really is the core of our existence and of all existence. And then we just muck it all up with all of our traumas and beliefs and conditioning and imprints and minds. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's amazing. The the work you're doing is incredible. And and you have written three books or so we oh vibrational upgrade is the second one third one is reasonable dragons and the fourth one is the dragon master creatrix yeah and reasonable dragons is on audible and people have been really enjoying that so it's the only one i have on audible so those of you who are on audible.com you may want to check it out but yeah my most recent book where i answer a lot of really specific questions is the dragon master creatrix conversations with a female spiritual teacher for these new times it's advanced. It's told in story form of a woman who goes on retreat with me to get trained in energy medicine. I take her to power spots and ancient sites while she's engaging in learning how to work with the ancient wisdom and become a vibrational upgrade practitioner herself. The second half of every chapter is me answering their questions. And it's not like about how do I open my third eye as much as it's about like, how do I stop caring what other people think of me? They're very real down to earth. So I apply the holistic model to the daily life living questions. So that fourth book is entirely different than the first three. All of them are purely nonfiction, the first three. And the one that's the most text-like is the one I wrote while still in Asia for my dissertation. It started as my dissertation, but it became, what if there's nothing wrong? That's the one where I address Western medicine the most and use studies and stats and stuff. So if you're into that, that's where to go for that one. (laughs) And can all of these books be found on Amazon? Yeah, but you have to make sure you use Allison J, the middle initial J, K A Y, because there's another Allison K on there. That so just put the okay. J, you get all my books. And I will link that in the show notes for everybody. And then, yes, just a reminder that the fourth book, The Dragon Master Creatrix, is on Audible, which is I love Audible. So that's great. 
Thank you so much for coming mm-hmm. on. That was, I learned so much. I'm like, whew, you're right. I do need a nap. Yeah. So check it out. It's actually my third book, Reasonable Dragons. That's on Audible, not the fourth book. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries because you're feeling spacey. The work that I do helps create spaciousness so that you can get into just out of the everyday intellectual mind in to other parts of your system. So you're feeling the effects knowing that what I do works. So it's, it's please space out and let yourself go nap. I'm very that, spacey. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So analysts, it was an honor to have you so hungry to understand um, and for genuine purposes and, and hallelujah to you for doing this podcast for the reasons that you do it and your courage and boldness. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate that. I truly mean it. Thanks for listening, everyone. For more information, please head over to lightaftertrauma.com or you can also follow us on social media. On Instagram, we are at lightaftertrauma and on Twitter, it is at lightafterpod. And if you're on Facebook, please be sure to join our Facebook group. It is a private community where trauma survivors are able to connect and chat with one another. That Facebook group is called Light After Trauma. So just look us up on Facebook and be sure to join. Lastly, please head over to patreon.com slash light after trauma to support our show. We are asking for $5 a month, which is the equivalent to a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So please head on over again. That's patreon.com slash light after trauma. Thank you, and we appreciate your support. Someday more.